ladies and gentlemen, I know this is a bit unexpected, but we're back for another game in the Mega Man X series. But why? The all-inclusive Mega Man X retrospective ended a while ago. Well, this year we are getting the Mega Man Zero series reviews, and I am a bit out of practice, so let's get back into the swing of things with a Mega Man video. I suddenly felt the need to play through Mega Man Maverick Hunter X while on my break from YouTube, and I looked back in my review of X1 where I called it a versus video like MGS1. However, Maverick Hunter X got a huge shaft in that review, and many comments had pointed that out. In general, that review is pretty mediocre, so I decided to calculate how much time I spent in that review on Maverick Hunter X, and the answer was... A minute and 40 seconds. So in this bonus episode of the all-inclusive retrospective, we're correcting the sins of the past for revisiting Mega Man Maverick Hunter X for the PlayStation Portable. By the time Maverick Hunter X was made to remake the original Mega Man X for a new audience, the X series had gone on to have 7 sequels and 3 spin-offs. Sales were falling off the cliff, and while many fans will say Capcom's marketing is why, I completely disagree. I think Mega Man fans just weren't buying all these games because the mid-2000s was a giant Mega Man overload. Think about it. From 2000 to 2010, we got the following. Mega Man X5, Mega Man Extreme 2, Mega Man X6, Mega Man Legends 2, Misadventures of Tron Bond, Mega Man 0 1, Mega Man 0 2, 0 3, 0 4, Mega Man and Base release on GBA, Mega Man Battle Network 1 through 6 and their Pokemon esque variations, Mega Man Star Force 1 through 3, and thanks to all the variations, there's literally 7 Star Force games in existence. 7! Network Transmission X7, X Command Mission X8, Mega Man Powered Up. Mega Man Anniversary Collection, the Mega Man X Collection, the Mega Man Zero Collection, Mega Man Maverick Hunter X, Mega Man ZX, ZX Advent, Mega Man 9, and Mega Man 10. In my opinion, there were just too many games released at once, which turned audiences off, which is unfortunate because a lot of these were pretty good games, with Mega Man Maverick Hunter X the PSP being one of those. I don't plan on giving this a 40 minute review, but like I said earlier, my X1 review barely talked about Maverick Hunter X, so I just want to give it a spotlight for a quick Jay's Reviews episode. Back in the original video, one of the aspects I thought I had done quite a bit of justice to was the presentation. The story arc here is exactly the same as the original Mega Man X. X joins the Maverick Hunters when Sigma starts a rebellion, but X gets badly beaten by Vile, to which his friend Zero saves him, and we then play through the eight Maverick stages, become more powerful, uncover the truth of X's past, and try to defeat Sigma and Vile, and succeed, but at the cost of Zero's life. Context, build-up, and payoff is the real difference here. Similar to X5 and onward, X has a brief dialogue with each Maverick, and as opposed to spouting absolute junk in a vain attempt to be philosophical in a Mega Man X game, here we learn things about the characters and why they do what they do, and why they would want to join Sigma. Whether it be boredom like Chill Penguin, a sense of loyalty to Sigma like Storm Eagle, or how Spark Mandrill just isn't very smart, and as a result he isn't quite sure what's right and so Sigma told him what to think. It's stuff like this that really fleshes out the world and characters, with one of my favorite details in the whole narrative being how the boss rush begins with Launch Octopus with this cutscene. Launch Octopus? I am Launch Octopus. I am under orders to deal with any intruders. Sigma must have brought his body back to life. I have been ordered to fight. That one scene makes a much more powerful statement than anything in X7 or X8. Because Sigma works so hard to convince people that they should work alongside him since they as Raploids are worth more than these humans, and as a result, they should feel as if they should get that treatment. With X and Zero taking them down as they go on, the boss rush is always a game mechanic first and a part of the storyline. Never. But this explains it gameplay-wise, but also recontextualizes it into a reason as to why Sigma is so evil. The reason being that after X beats all the Mavericks, Sigma brought their bodies back to life. But not their personalities! I enjoyed all of the quirky Maverick personalities we got. Like, who didn't like the flamboyant Launch Octopus? So to see them back, but basically soulless versions of themselves, it shows how Sigma does not care about them or Magma Dragoon, or Neon Tiger. They're all just numbers for his side, which is a dark twist to the whole boss rush idea. Back to the whole point of build-up and payoff, Sigma gets mentioned several times by Vile and Zero, as well as X during the intro stage, with every single Maverick and X debating about Sigma for the whole game. So now Sigma's on the top of your mind as opposed to some guy who just shows up at the last level who was mentioned once in passing, and where you need to read the manual and play sequels in order to understand. X1 built up a vile battle at the end, but Maverick Hunter X has both of the villains in your mind from start to finish. Sigma himself is so amazing in this game when it comes to writing. 
as the retrospective went on, I was highlighting just how bad Sigma was when it came to the ridiculous comebacks and just how stupid his entire personality was. But playing Maverick Hunter X again makes you remember how good Sigma was for a long time. He had a point to his personality in X1 through X4 and was tied to some serious emotions in X5. He had a message, a moral debate, and so on. But that gets undermined by coming back in X6 and even worse in X7 with the god awful voice acting. But here? Oh man. Sigma and Maverick Hunter X are some of the best acting in the entire Mega Man series. This game comes with a miniature movie called The Day of Sigma that details everything that happened before the events of the game, including Sigma's time when he was leading the Maverick Hunters. He just seems so charismatic and caring. However, when he turns Maverick, he unleashes a nuclear weapon on a populated city, killing Dr. Kane himself. There are many others on my side. You see, evolution requires sacrifice. <laughs> Behold! thus setting Maverick Hunter X in its own continuity that was supposed to be followed by sequels. But alas, the reason this is his own timeline was because X2 and X3 showed Dr. Kane being alive and an aide to X, as well as X4 showing us that Zero was responsible for Sigma's scars, with Maverick Hunter X showing us that it was X. But as I was saying though, Sigma's personality, he's just so deliciously evil that you have to love him, but again, he's got a bunch of serious points. But I just love how committed he is to being a Maverick. Take the ending scene of the Day of Sigma for example. <laughs> come and get me, X. The time has come to prove your mettle against me. This fight will decide the fate of all Reploids. The battle may be over, but the war is just beginning. <laughs> Sigma isn't the only voice that was really well done, though. X, Zero, and Vile are all voiced by Mark Gotha, Lucas Gilbertson, and Rob Rhodes, whom all returned from X Command Mission in X8. And while they weren't perfect in either of those games, they've really hit their stride here in terms of emotion and inflection. And this is something only someone like myself would know. But on your first few playthroughs, X sounds very uncertain when in cutscenes with the Mavericks. But if you play the game a million times, then the dialogue changes with X sounding far more assertive. Which is a fantastic detail! Especially for 2015 Jay, who had played this game front to back, like, every day. Storm Eagle! Don't tell me that even you've gone Maverick! Answer me, Storm Eagle! You're not the type of Reploid to do something like this! Storm Eagle, have you gone Maverick too? I won't deny that. If that's the case, I have no choice but to destroy you. When it comes to voice acting and story, one of my favorite scenes is X's ending. X has accomplished the mission, and like what was established next one's ending, the fight now goes on. But X returns to the garage only to see Zero's bike left behind. A very sad moment considering the also tragic death scene which is a vast improvement over the one in X1 since we got the great acting as well as more build up. All this being accompanied by the scene of Dr. Kane finding X with the final words of Dr. Light playing over it. What's this? My name is Thomas Light. I am the researcher who designed and built Mega Man X. <coughs> I granted X special powers that no other robot possesses. Utilizing his conscience, he is able to think, worry, and act entirely of his own accord. In general, I think this is the best Dr. Light I have ever seen. With his voice, you can really buy the serious emotions that were intended with the light capsules. Nowadays, you always think of the fact that Light seriously has made enough of these damn capsules to last so many games, but in Maverick Hunter X, it really feels tragic. Thanks to X4, we know that Light presumably lost all of his creations to Zero, and in his last days built X to save the future. The actor also has a ton of range since he later played Light and Powered Up, the remake of Mega Man 1. In that, he played a light-hearted and goofy Dr. Light, what you'd come to expect from classic series light. But like I established here, he's playing a Dr. Light in his final moments, and the contrast is quite nice. Having said all this, that covers the story. Graphically, Maverick Hunter X is like X8 when it comes to the look of the models, however it's nowhere near as muddy as X8 was in that regard, with the crappy textures and sloppy models. Maverick Hunter X is of course on a PSP screen, with the resolution being lower than X8, but the art direction makes up for that since the models are much more appealing with the environments that look much more interesting. 
Speaking of interesting environments, that was one thing in X1 that showed where the graphics were lacking since many of the backgrounds were a bit generic and flat in terms of the color choices and details. With Maverick Hunter X obviously being a vast improvement in that regard, with not only more color and detail, but more life in general, making the environments more practical. I talked about the soundtrack in my original look, and my opinion is generally the same. All the pieces you know and love from X1 are back and completely redone. As we all know, different means ruined, but let's take a look at it. I think most of Maverick Hunter X's soundtrack is pretty good. It's pretty hard to ruin good composition to begin with, but still. Some of the best pieces being the intro stage, Storm Eagle, Chill Penguin, and Sigma Stage 1, and the final boss especially. <laughs> These ones really capture the atmospheres of the environments they belong to, all the while staying true to the original piece. Some of the weakest ones being Sigma Palaces 2 and 3 and Armored Armadillo. These have a different energy to them than the original pieces do, and I just don't think it fits as well. But all in all, a pretty good soundtrack that I wouldn't have too many objections raised to if you asked me to listen to it. The controls in X8 were the smoothest the series had seen with seamless dashes and incredibly fluid wall jumps, which was great coming off how terribly those elements were handled in Mega Man X7. I've noticed Maverick Hunter X isn't nearly as smooth as X8, but it's still quite good, and some of the best action in the series. The only real difference between the two is that in Maverick Hunter X I usually have a harder time dash jumping off of walls. Initially, I thought this was the fault of the Vita's buttons, but this is actually just the game. Beyond that, X runs, jumps, and charges up to two levels, and later a third. One complaint I have with this is that, for whatever reason, charging a shot in Maverick Hunter X takes longer than it does in other X games, which usually throws me off, since I often shoot the green shot because I forgot about the longer wait period. Especially with the arm parts. Some bosses take longer because of this, like Boomer Kawanger. Um, sorry, Boomerang Kawanger. Also, the bosses have much longer periods of invincibility when facing them, which really screwed with my head when playing this again, so I'm used to the timing of everything in the original. This really isn't a flaw per se, just more of an observation, but I figured it was worth mentioning nonetheless. But as a remake, there really aren't as many changes as you may think. Remakes are a good chance to overhaul games of the past and give them an updated presentation and gameplay. Zero Mission and Ocarina 3D are firm examples of that. However, in the case of X1, there really weren't many game-breaking issues to fix. They really did a fantastic job when it came to improving the story and the way it was presented, but the gameplay does not make many improvements that came from the sequels. This is a letdown in my opinion because the original Mega Man X collection was going to have all these great features like the X8 team redubbing X4 and X6, no Guns N' Roses names for X5, entirely remixed soundtracks for X1 and X2, in addition to the technical improvements that were already in the collection. All bogged down by 240p, but what can you do? Inafune said no and wanted to implement these things in his series of remakes for X1 to X6. Since this game didn't sell well, all of those great things were lost to the ether. Point is that the X Collection didn't get that cool stuff because of the Maverick Hunter X series, so this game should have been a massive improvement over the original. X1 is one of my favorite games of all time, so I'm not losing sleep over this since Maverick Hunter X is in my top 5 X games for sure since it's so close to the original, but from an analytical standpoint, I feel disappointed since more could have been done. For example, the intro stage is the exact same runtime as X1, the pointless second encounter with the mini boss is still there, as well as a long stretch of nothing in the middle. In fact, we now have the ability to replay the intro stage, which is nice, I guess. And just like the original, we now have to go track down the foot parts since level design that's obviously meant for the dash must be played with the default running speed, making these levels seem so much slower than they probably are. The dash was given a default in X2, and the air dash was given a default in X7. You don't have to give us the air dash, but you do have to give us the dash, because that is a series staple that was default for 10 other games. Sure, X gets it in the X1 storyline, 
but just give it a different property like Extreme 1 which had made the foot parts give you the dash jump from walls. It's not that hard. The guys who made this came up with that idea. But by far the biggest issue with the original X was the fact that without the dash, bosses that were pretty cool to Buster became frustrating affairs of getting your ass kicked because you really could use the dash jump as an edge in dodging attacks. But no, this is completely left unchanged in Maverick Hunter X. So say I pick Armadillo first, I'm gonna get wrecked because I can hardly damage him and he can kill you in no time flat. If we give X3 flack for this, X1 and Maverick Hunter X are getting it as well. If anything, some bosses are a lot harder now than they were in X1 since they have way more attacks here to add variety, which would be great. We don't have an edge whatsoever if you're going after them first. Like I said, these three things don't kill the game. Once you have the dash boots, which I do every time so I know what I'm doing, the game becomes fantastic. And since Maverick Hunter X changes almost nothing else, it's just as fun as X1. The placement of heart tanks, sub tanks, and light capsules are all the same as well. So if you know how to play X1 100%, then you should have this game down, no problem. Only difference being how the heart tank and spark mandrel stage can't be gotten via a dash jump. In addition to this, the Dr. Light capsules have not been relocated, but reshuffled, if that makes any sense. The foot parts are acquired in an obvious spot in Flame Mammoth stage, with you needing the foot parts to get the head parts in Chill Penguin stage, and you need those for the body parts in Storm Eagle stage. And you can get the arm parts with this pathetic mini boss. I don't like this at all. You can get the arm parts after the foot parts, but the other three are gotten in this really scripted sequence, and I think that takes away some of the customization. Functionally, though, these are identical to the X1 counterparts. Except the arm parts. Well, not the ones from Light. Those are exactly like X1. But if you don't get the one from Light, the one from Zero is unique, which is a good addition over X1. Mixes up the gameplay a little and lets you, the player, experiment with different options. And it really isn't until the Sigma stages where things are a bit different. For example, the first stage goes underground and into the water as we sneak into the palace, with the bow spider battle at the end being far more forgiving in timing, meaning the RZ won't have to whine nearly as long about how hard it is, with stage 2 being a rise from the caverns, with the pit section from stage 1 of X1 put here in stage 2 as the way in, with similar set pieces to the stages we've already played, with stage 3 visually being far more interesting here than in X1 with the flags and purple walls. As well as being in a spot where we battle Vile as opposed to Stage 1, with both bosses for Sigma 2 and 3 being identical to the original. And with Sigma 4 being the same, only now he's even easier to Hadouken. After beating the game, you unlock two other modes. First being hard mode, which I think is... meh. I beat the whole thing, and it's pretty generic hard mode stuff, like increased damage for bosses as opposed to the cool stuff like European extreme modes in MGS games. Everything you know from the main game is there, and so if you play your cards right, you shouldn't have a problem. Especially since I've beaten this game more times than I'd like to admit. But that's neither here nor there. Yeah, what he said. If you need a frame of reference, the hard mode Maverick Hunter X is just like X3. Starts out brutally hard because of stupid stuff, and then once you get some power-ups, it's pretty easy. The other mode being a new playable character. Not Zero, not Axel, but Vile. This is cool. Somebody should have slapped 2016J across the face for his piece on Vile's gameplay, since I only showed the intro stage, since like I said, that was as far as I got. But how could it be that hard? I went back and actually tried it this time, and found myself delighted to see the challenge. Vile's mode does actually have stages that are slightly remixed with enemy placement that's more difficult to deal with since Vile doesn't work like the three hunters we've grown to know. He has three abilities you can equip, one for the arm cannon, one for the cannon on his back, and one for him to drop from the legs. Defeating bosses will give you equipable parts in these three categories, and you can't use all at once. It works like the skill shop in Sonic Generations where all of these have points and depending on their value you might only use one or two if they're that good. This is the kind of mix and match gameplay that I can get into. He also doesn't have a dash, but unlike X, I don't mind since his ground speed is much higher and his style of gameplay isn't about getting past the nuisance enemies, it's about strategically getting past them without getting your ass kicked. With the item placement also mixed up, meaning that you're going to have to rethink this entire game, and I like that in an alternate mode. The only flaw I have with this mode being how for some stupid reason they decide to have the same generic piece play in the background of every single stage. Why? Sure, go the X4 and onwards route of every character getting their own intro stage music, but not one piece for the entire game. I don't know, the issue with that really speaks for itself. But hey, 
He also has his own storyline, which is different from that of X, since he's trying to thwart Sigma's plan to bring X's full potential to light, since he thinks he deserves that praise. With him absolutely devastating X and Zero in the ending, but ultimately losing, only to then be left behind by a disappointed Sigma. Possibly a setup for Vile's comeback in Mega Man Maverick Hunter X3, which I'll never see come to life. Ah, thanks guys. Which only leaves me with the conclusion. What do I think of Mega Man Maverick Hunter X? It's funny. I consider this game to be very high up there in the Mega Man X lineup, ranking fourth behind X1, X2, and X4, and just above X3. Why is that though? If X1 is so top tier, then why is this behind X2 and X4? Well, I used to say Maverick Hunter X was my second favorite, but after 2015 Jay hung up his Mega Man hat, I hardly went back to this one. Of course, the amount of playthroughs I'd rather not list might have been a factor, but I still come back to X1 through X4 in a second's notice, and I think the fact of the matter is that the game's lack of improvements in the gameplay department really brings it down, since this is a remake, and if it's mostly shot for shot when they could have taken the chance to modernize the game in more ways than just graphics, story, and controls, I don't know why they didn't take it. I would have sacrificed Vile to get better balanced bosses or a default dash. On its own merits though, this game is still phenomenal with great level design, weapons, replayability that's through the roof, as well as production values that I can more than get down with. The sad thing is, playing this game nowadays isn't that easy. You either have to have a PSP or a Vita. If it was readily available, I'd say get both since these are two top of the line games, but the access to the original and the obscurity of Maverick Hunter X inclines me to tell you that if X1 is a game you're only ever going to play once, make it X1. And that's all the time we have for today. I hope you guys enjoyed this throwback to Maverick Hunter X as much as I enjoyed going back to the game. And with all that said and done, I want to make sure it's crystal clear that I love Maverick Hunter X to death and have so many memories of playing it in a very down time for me. But it does have flaws like any other game does. With this video finished, I now feel like I'm truly done with the X series. And now all I can say is, bring on the X Legacy Collections! I'm ready to have day one reviews, live streams, and all kinds of coverage for that stuff for you guys. In addition, I'm hoping some X fan games come out this year so I can tackle them as well. No pressure on any devs out there since I'm glad they're going to wait, but I figured I'd get that out there. And of course, there's also the Mega Man Zero content which will be released exactly on...